2015 Energy and Environment Committee. Uh, we are not going to be playing with uh, a full deck today. It's Mr. Weezer and myself. <laughs> but the game's not rigged, so we'll be in good shape here. We're, we're, uh, Council Member Weezer and I will be uh, hearing today's items, which means that we will not have a quorum. Uh, but despite that, we will have a robust conversation. I uh, can, can't take items on consent because we don't have... Uh, um, uh, a quorum, but uh, just to let those folks in the audience who are here on item two, we're going to be pretty good with that, I would imagine. No. But I would like to take item number seven out of order, so if there are any speaker cards uh, to item number seven, please make sure that you uh, get them to the clerk so that we may um, speak to that item. And so with that, uh, Council Member Weezer, would you like to lead the conversation, please, on item number seven? Sure. Thank you very much. And I think staff may... Uh, from Let's DW have the, uh, our CLA read the item for us. <laughs> well, go ahead, Mr. Weezer. Well, I think staff is here uh, to uh, also... I have, I'll have. i open up the item, but um, CLA wants to read the item into the record. That would be great. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Certainly. Mr. Chair, Mr. Weezer. Item number seven relates to the motion of Huizar Fuentes relative to request the department to report in regard to the standard maintenance and upgrade procedures which require draining water and the methods used to reduce water waste during these procedures. We have staff in the Department of Water and Power. Great. Well, thank you. This is a, a motion in response to an incident that occurred in Eagle Rock uh, back in March and uh, where uh, some residents contacted my office through social media and also contacted the media directly about some water going into our storm drains. Uh, some of the residents actually started using some of the water to water their lawns, water their roses. Some collected it in buckets to wash their cars. And, and they saw the value that this water has, and it was going into our storm drains. So uh, we immediately called DWP, and they responded immediately. They went out uh, with a, uh, some water trucks and actually captured as much of the water as they could uh, to reuse it. And, um, the, but the question remained, what will we do from there? Uh, how will we now um, change practices within WP uh, in light of the drought? And um, I want to thank DWP for uh, your uh, quick response to our motion. I want to thank the chair of this committee for agendizing this motion as quickly as he did. And so we're here today to hear from DWP as to what are their policies and procedures in place whenever there is a need for maintenance in any of our reservoirs or pipes so that we do not simply waste our water but reuse it in some fashion. So I'd, with that, I'd like to open it up to the department to give a presentation on our, our new policies uh, on this. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, my name is Marty Adams. I'm the uh, Senior Assistant General Manager for the Water System for LA Water and Power. With me, I have uh, Steve Cole, my far left, who's our uh, Engineering Manager for our Water Distribution. Mr. Keith Session is our Director of Water Distribution Division, who heads up all our field crews. And to my right is Brionia Lindsay, who actually was, uh, at the time, the uh, superintendent in the Central District area, who quickly mobilized the crews to uh, collect that water and get it in tanker trucks and take it to somewhere that it could be utilized uh, when, when the activity was pointed out to us that uh, we needed to be changing our methods. As a result of the uh, incident that, that you cited in Eagle Rock, uh, you know, we looked at our practices of what we've been doing in the water system and, and what we need to do to change. Uh, typically in the water industry, uh, I, I liken fixing a pipe to fixing a tire. You, know, you have to take the air out of the tire to make a patch or make a repair and then fill it back up. Well, the same thing was true with a reservoir or a water tank or a water pipe. You can't work on it with the water inside. And it's, it's been very easy in the past to just dispose of that water down the storm drain. But the water, as we know, has become extremely valuable in the state and particularly in the city. And we have to regard it differently than we've done in the past. And so uh, we're pleased to bring to you a, a, a policy that we've put together directing our field crews of how we'll handle that water in the future. This is process water as we regard it as part of the process of us doing our work of maintaining and rebuilding the infrastructure of the water system, but a way that we can do it in a much smarter and much more environmentally sensitive fashion. And so 
in the past where we used to simply dump water down the storm drain, which is what was occurring in Eagle Rock when it came to your office's attention, and, and, uh, and we stopped that action. We're putting new processes and plans and uh, policies in place to make sure that we're making use of as much water as possible. And certainly, um, I'm not going to imply that we're going to be able to catch every single drop because uh, there's you know, a certain amount of work with connections and, and other things. And sometimes there's construction water that's very muddy that may have to be diverted otherwise. But the water that we have in our pipelines, we're going to do everything in our power to move it to other places in the water system, either by shuttling across to different service areas by putting it in water tankers and moving it to where there's a park or other green space facilities that, that could certainly use water during this time of drought, uh, by discharging it into sewer systems where they, those systems are tributary to uh, uh, water reclamation plants, which is something that has been great addition to the city's uh, in a portfolio for water resources. In the past, we didn't have this opportunity, but the city has increased its, its uh, wastewater reclamation to such a great extent that a lot of our sewers do lead to places where the water become processed and then be beneficially used as recycled water, which again offsets the use of, of potable water. And then also sometimes we may move that water to some place where we can actually let it recharge the groundwater basin and become part of future year's water supply as groundwater. And so we've, we've outlined a, a set of criteria by which we, our field crews can use uh, their judgment to, to relocate that water to the best and most efficient use. Uh, we're working with the Department of Recreation and Parks on park space that can use water. We're working closely with the Bureau of Sanitation on on sewers that can accept the water that will go and become recycled water down the road. And, uh, and, and looking at this as more of a, as a kind of a holistic solution and, and a, a set of, uh, of tools in our tool chest that will allow us to, uh, to not waste this water but put it to the highest and best environmental use that we can so that there's, there's a number of beneficial uses some back in the drinking water system, some offsetting drinking water, some becoming the future drinking water, and others helping the LA environment to maintain itself as best possible during the time of drought. And so that's what we have in front of you today is, is our, our plan of action for that and commitment from the Department of Water and Power that uh, from this day forward, uh, our business as usual will, will be a different norm and that we will be looking at our, our water resources uh, for their full value and to make sure that as we do our work that we set a proper example for the citizens of Los Angeles so we can lead by example as part of the city family because we do know that how we treat our water is, is very closely viewed by the public and, and we need to treat it with, the, with the, the proper value that we would like the public to treat it with so that the conservation message is consistent throughout the city. Great, thank you. And so what we hear is that instead of uh, allowing this water simply to go into the storm drains and out to the ocean, we will either divert it to other pipes in the area to continue to be used as drinkable, usable water, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps send a water tank to take that water elsewhere to water our golf courses, our parks, or some green spaces, or send it to our sewers where we already have some recycling policies or programs in place. Uh, and are these uh, internal policies or just uh, uh, practice or a protocol directive to staff? Or how, how does this take place? So, so this is a new policy that we're putting out. And then uh, Keith, through his, uh, through his management structure, will uh, he has we have other groups that that discharge water in the past and that will be also use, using new policy they were involved with the writing of the policy to make sure it addresses their crew needs but most of the water crews that do work in the streets that are replacing our infrastructure which again the replacement of the infrastructure as you pointed out is a vital component of making sure that we save water because the less leaks then the more water we save and so Keith and his uh, management, management team will be rolling out this policy to all of their crews, and it is a policy in place. It's an expectation. It's not, not merely a suggestion, and they'll be managing that on a district-by-district district level, level throughout the city to make sure that it's adhered to. Excellent. And as part of our own conservation efforts, I, I was explained at one time that we're going to go out and fix more leaks to make sure that we're not <laughs> wasting water. Um, and so it seems to me that we'll probably be doing this more often, right? But... Uh, earlier, I also heard that we would perhaps, because of this effort, now save millions of gallons of water uh, as we have this new practice in place. So thank you so much. Um, and I think the important part of this is the message we send out, as much as the importance of saving those millions of gallons of water. But if we're asking our residents, our constituents, to conserve, it's a, we got to lead by example. 
And so if we do everything possible within our own operations, I think it's going to really send a message in this uh, crisis that we're in. So uh, thank you for your efforts. And again, thank you to your staff who went out there immediately uh, uh, and surveyed the situation, corrected it. And I know my chief of staff was in touch with the general manager. I, and so I want to thank her as well for her responsiveness in, in this effort. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Weezer. And I just want to echo the sentiments, uh, but thank you, Mr. Weezer, for your leadership on this. When we have breaks and leaks, we can't plan for them. But if we're going to dewater and can plan for them, then we should absolutely uh, collect and store as much of the water as possible. And because of your efforts, we now have a guideline and a policy for how the department can plan its uh, reclamation of water that otherwise would be uh, thrown away. So thank you very much. Thank you. So we will go ahead and in the event, Mr. Prieto, that we uh, establish a quorum, uh, we'll, we'll hold, let's hold it on the desk and maybe we can get three votes here to move everything. If not, we'll just go ahead and uh, communicate the note and file at some point. So that takes us back to item number one. Thank, thank you, very you very much. much. Thank, you. thank you. There are no speaker cards on item number seven, so we'll go ahead and proceed to item number one. Item number one. City Attorney, Administrative Officer and City Attorney reports an ordinance relative to the issuance of Los Angeles Wastewater System Revenue Bonds. Natalie Brill, the CAO. Good afternoon, Ms. Brill. Good afternoon. Natalie Brill at the CAO's office. Um, the CAO report in front of you requests authority to refund up to $269 million in wastewater system bonds. We're refinancing approximately $110 million in commercial paper for projects that have been completed into long-term debt and issuing $200 million in new money for capital projects uh, for a total of about $575 million if the market is in our favor. The first transaction is scheduled for May 21st, and it's a refunding in the new money piece. Uh, the issuance will be with the senior uh, manager of Siebert, Branford Shank, and the co-senior managers, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. And there's two co-managers, Backstrom McCarley and Morgan Stanley. The second transaction, uh, because we have to do them 15 days apart for, uh, to have two separate deals and for arbitrage purposes, will be on June 9th and will be just a refunding and the commercial paper piece. The senior manager is Citigroup. The co-senior is Jeffries. And the co-managers are J.P. Morgan and Loop Capital. We expect net present value savings of up to $23 million for the life of the bonds, subject to market conditions. After the last two days, I think we're looking to closer to 20 to $19 million. The market moved away from us a little bit. Over 25 or 30 years is the life Over, of yeah. Um, so there's about uh, 20 years left on the debt. Okay. So over 20 years, about a $1 million a year. Um, also submitted with this staff report is the city attorney's ordinance establishing the, uh, the fund. There is no general fund impact since this is solely based on wastewater revenue. And um, the other thing that we're doing, kind of exciting, is that for the first time we're issuing what we call green bonds, which are bonds that are attractive to investors who are socially responsible. Um, it's basically a new program. It's been around for about two years. So all the projects that we're doing with wastewater in the first series are considered green because they have some type of environmental or waste quality to them. So that's very exciting for the city to be able to participate in that type of program. Very good. Mr. Weezer, any questions? No. Very good. We will go ahead and uh, we'll hold the item in the event that we get a quorum. And if so, uh, we will uh, move it. If not, we'll just communicate to the full, full city council the approval and recommendation of your report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's go ahead and go to item number two, please. Item number two. DWP and CAO reports relative to proposed agreement with Osmos Utilities for maintenance of Osmos FastGate gateway software. This agreement is for $1.3 million, and it consists of a three-year agreement. Very good. If you could very succinctly let us know what it is that we're doing here, I think we're going to be okay once we get a quorum. Good afternoon, Mr. Weezer. Uh, this contract is needed to provide continuing maintenance, support, escrow service as needed, professional service for Osmos Utility Services, incorporates proprietary software FastGate. Software serves as basically a... A translation is bridge translates information from our digital mapping system and to transfer it to our outage management system that is a 24 by 7 mission critical application. During any storm or emergency, the outage management system is used by dispatchers to identify emergency situations, prioritize the work, and to dispatch it to the appropriate crew. Without the geographic information being integrated into the outage management system, it would lead to increased response times and inability to group singular outages to a problem that is further upstream on the circuit. 
dispatchers will not be able to easily grasp the enormity of an outage event versus a single event. So we respectfully request your approval to move this forward. Very good. What does the CAO's office think? CAO supports. Very good. Contract. Uh, we'll go ahead and hold that item again. There are no speaker cards. Thank you for your presentation. Let's go ahead to item number three, please. Number three. DWP report relative to amending the city's emergency water conservation plan ordinance to create a two-day-a-week watering schedule and related uh, matters associated with the ordinance. Good Representative from DWP. I'm sorry. Good afternoon. Mr. Adams. Thank you. Um, Again, Marty Adams here with uh, Dave Pettyjohn, our Director of Water Resources, and Penny Falcon. Uh, we are bringing to you a change in the city's uh, water conservation ordinance. The current ordinance uh, that has been in place uh, for at least a decade and a half ha uh, has uh, stages that go from the current three-day a week watering to the next phase would take us down to one day a week watering. And we recognize that uh, uh, as many cities are doing, we need the opportunity to have an in-between phase, something that's, uh, uh, that makes a little more sense as a next step if we have to go to that measure to save more water in order to meet both the mayor's directive and the new directive from the governor. And and so what we've uh, done, it was passed by the LA Water and Power Board of Commissioners uh, uh, two meetings ago, and is brought to the Energy Environment Committee to hopefully go to full council for approval, is a change to the ordinance that Penny will outline that gets us to allow a two-day a week provision if the city council should so uh, decide, and also makes a few other corrections that we felt were necessary to the existing ordinance to make it uh, uh, more effective in the future if we have to go to additional phases. So um, Penny will detail uh, what the changes are. I want to clarify that by, by considering this today, we're looking at changing the overall ordinance and the provisions that it has. We're not looking to change this, the phase that we're in currently. We're only looking to have uh, the better tools in the toolbox that allow us uh, uh, some more options for the future if we have to go to those. And Mr. Adams, I think that bears uh, repeating. Uh, it's important for us to repeat because there's a little confusion out there. Some people seem to think that we are moving across the different phases now, and what this does is it gives us some additional tools in the toolbox here if and when we have to move to phase three, but we're currently in phase two. Yeah, that's correct. Very and good. so, and we would continue to be in that phase if we believe that we needed to go to a new phase. It would either be an act of the Board of Water Power Commissioners going to the mayor's office and then to the full city council to make that change or the mayor's office to the city council to make that change. This is just to put uh, a change to the ordinance so that we have this provision on the books if we so need it. Very good. Okay, Penny. so what I'd like to do is just uh, I'm sorry, give you... Before before, uh, on that point, uh, if so needed. Um, so w it would be an administrative change when we do that? It would not come to council for... It, it'll actually, to change the stages, we'll have to go to city council for a vote. It would have to come to yes. city council for yeah. a vote. But it's just, it's there, it's available. We just have a matrix, a... That, that's correct. So plan we, in place and how... Right, so we, we felt that we have a gap in the current ordinance. And, and the gap is... Uh, is a pretty important gap because at three day a week watering, uh, we've been very effective to save a lot of water. The next stage right now would go to one day a week. And so, which uh, at that point is, is a, a complete game changer. And so uh, the ability to, to have a two day a week provision we th we, is, a, is a missing link we think that's important to have available for us as a tool if we need it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, simply what I, we've done is provided you a table that identifies in yellow the proposed changes. So the first one is actually in phase one, and it's just modifying. We currently have in that phase no outdoor watering when it rains, but uh, due to the recent State Water Resource Control Board regulations and recommendations, we've added in their language that it includes within 48 hours after a measurable rain event. This is coming from their exact current language that they have at the state. Uh, the, big one, the big issue that we've added is the new phase three that Marty spoke about. It's uh, adding the two days a week watering, and it's also the two other things that have been added are recommended use of pool covers and recommended washing of vehicles at commercial car wash facilities. Now, what this does is just sets up for our customers to be aware that in the next phase, if we ever went to phase four, that's when it's mandated for them to use pool covers, and it's mandated that they only wash their vehicles at commercial car wash facilities. So although this is just a recommendation, we think it's important just to get our customers and all of Angelino's thinking about this. 
So the other uh, phase or change was in phase four, the no filling of decorative ponds, lakes, or similar structures that are used for only aesthetic pur purposes with potable water. So that was currently something that was missing in our ordinance and we felt it was very important based on the state regulations and, and uh, discussions that are occurring that we add that to our phase. And uh, again, the mandatory uh, use of pool covers is added in phase six um, and that was a new requirement. In phase five, what's highlighted there is moving the no filling of residential swimming pools from the current phase four to phase five and that's better to align with at that time there's no outdoor irrigation. Now, historical studies have shown us that the use of uh, water on turf compares very similarly to the use of water that a pool owner would have for that same um, square footage in their backyard. So uh, we felt that aligning, if we're finally going to ask our turf owners to shut off their irrigation, that's when we would ask our pool owners to also stop filling their pools. So um, that's been added at that one. And then the very last one that's been added is just identifying that golf courses and uh, professional sports fields, there was a missing item here that when it gets to a place where we're not allowing outdoor ir irrigation, because again, the restriction on outdoor ir irrigation applies to all our customers, commercial and residential. What we don't want to do is impact our businesses. And so the, the sports, the businesses of like Dodger Stadium um, and our uh, golf courses, we want to make sure that all the investment that they've done to get their uh, fields and their golf greens and tees uh, into place that they don't lose that capital investment. So this only allows them to put down enough water so they don't lose that grass and it's only on golf tees and on the professional sports fields and they have to do that in the middle of the evening when there will be a, a, absolutely no evaporation. And with that, if you have any questions, we'd like to answer. If, if I could clarify just so it's clear, so one of the reasons the car washes is up there is that, you know, it's currently an ordinance that professional car washes have to have recirculating water systems. And so uh, it seems maybe unusual to say that you have to go, to, need to go to a car wash. What we're saying is that you, you shouldn't be washing your car in your yard with your hose running. And so this says that we want to do the, everything in the most efficient manner possible. And so that's, that's why the car wash is, is highlighted because the city's already made decisions to make the car washes as efficient as possible. We're, we're recognizing that that, uh, that that would be a necessity to use in the future if we get to that point. And again, as, as Penny said, on, this, on the professional courses for use of water outdoors, uh, one of the things we recognize is that some businesses, they're their business does involve outdoor water use as their business, just as a lot of businesses use water as part of their production indoors. And so the, the idea here is not to uh, economically punish uh, any business because of what, what their business is about, but to make sure that what water use they have to do is done in the most efficient manner while allowing the economy and the business and employees to, to, to stay you know, viable. The, uh, at the top of the, the matrix that you've shared with us, uh, phase one, phase two, phase three, you have percentages there. What, what, what do those indicate? The zero, the 15 percent, the 20 percent? Yeah, those are just estimates, and uh, we think that we'll get that, those levels of conservation at, in those phases, but those are just uh, rough estimates of what we think we'll get. For how much we'll save here. Yeah, item four is, 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 I think, will sort of tell us where we are relative to yep. the state water uh, resource control board mandates and our own mayor's uh, and city council's goals. But tell me a little bit about how historically, how effective have we been in water conservation? We've been in phase two for how long now? Since, go ahead. Well, since 2009. And we actually have a, a slide we're going to show you to d address your very question. And uh, you'll see a histogram that shows exactly how we've performed over time. It, it, so in no? item four, we'll, we'll get to yes. that. OK, very good. So I'll, I'll hold uh, additional questions until we get to item four, because I think that's going to be important for us to know exactly uh, how well we've been doing and where we need to go. So let's go ahead and take a public comment on item number three. Uh, Dr. Tom Williams and Amanda Begley, please. Good afternoon, Dr. Tom Williams, Citizens Coalition for a Safe Community and several others. Uh, basics, finally we're getting serious. However, where's the enforcement? Very nice to have all of these things up there, but I can do drip irrigation and nobody will know how many times a day, 
how many days a week, how many weeks a year I can irrigate my vegetation. However, we consume 60 gallons per person per day, which is almost half of that for the city of Los Angeles. Are you going to recognize such things? One thing I would highly recommend to be included in this is an identification of those areas where the water use is higher than the city average. City average is eh, 90 to 100 gallons per person per day. Recognize those areas that have met the requirements and those areas which have not. And focus on, eh, it's usually called shaming those areas because now that we have information, hey, we can say that Palo Verde uses 260 gallons and we only use 92 gallons and other people use lesser amounts. So add enforcement and rigorous enforcement and add public uh, measurements as to who's or what districts, what neighborhood councils, what zip codes are using most water, what areas are not. There's also a matter that most of the numbers are for city-wide use. So give us a list of all of the departments and how much water they actually use per person. That would be nice. Thank you. Hi, my, or, or wait. <laughs> Hi, my name is Amanda Begley and I work for Tree People. Uh, Tree People supports the two-day watering restriction. However, we would like to recommend that information be distributed and resources be made available that reflects the importance of maintaining a healthy tree canopy, even in face of a severe drought. This may encourage Angelinos to prioritize what they are watering with their scarce water. We are recommending this because trees are our most important infrastructure due to the tremendous and multiple benefits they offer. Studies from Australia show that the survival of trees is correlated with improved public health. We have learned from Australia's decade-plus drought that not only did their quality of life suffer immensely when their trees died, but public health was at risk. And with their extreme heat, people's lives were literally at risk. We hope you will consider this request. I've also brought copies of a one-page fact sheet infograph on keeping trees alive during drought. Great, thank you. Thank you. There are no additional cards. I do want to uh, highlight the point. I, I get an awful lot of uh, messages, Mr. Weezer, from people who say, why are we planting so many trees? And the trees really are important. They provide shade, they provide heat relief, they help clean uh, and take care of the air. And so that's a good use of water. Mm -hmm. It's not, everything that's green should not turn brown, <laughs> Mr. Weezer. So I want to make sure that uh, we, we echo that to all of our uh, and, citizens. And if you do it so right, you, nobody sees it. So we're going to go ahead to item number four now. Item number four. Motion Fuentes Bloomfield relative to request of the Department of Water and Power to report in regard to the State Water Resource Control Board's proposed regulatory framework for implementing the statewide conservation standard and related matters. You have staff DWP as well. Very good. And uh, this is an exciting item for me because it tells us hopefully where we are relative to the 16% conservation mandate that the State Water Resources Control Board has given the City of Los Angeles and ideally the path towards a 20% reduction that our good mayor has set out for the City of Los Angeles. So Mr. Adams, please lead the way. Thank you, uh, Marty Adams from Department of Water and Power here with Dave Pettyjohn from Water Resources and Penny Falcon from Water Resources as well. David will take us through the current situation with the uh, state emergency drought regulations, including the vote that the State Water Resources Control Board took about 8 o'clock last evening uh, and what it means for the City of Los Angeles for going forward as far as meeting the uh, requirements that the governor set forward. So I just wanted to give you a little background on how we got where we are today. So. Um, this is, of course, your item number four on the 16% water conservation standard for the city of LA. But as you know, California has been in a severe drought for multiple years now. 
and due to the dry conditions in January of uh, 17th of 2014, the governor declared a drought state of emergency, and then on July 29th of last year, the State Water Resources Control Board issued their first set of emergency water conservation regulations. And David, spend a little time. Why is it that we only have to conserve 16 percent and the governor has spoken to the 25 percent? I think that's really important for folks to understand. Yeah, that's a very good point. Our, our next slide is going to talk to that very Yeah, I'll be quiet. <laughs> 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 I, I hate to keep giving you that answer. Perfect, perfect segue. <laughs> I have All right. The deck that, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, um, essentially, but the, the droughts continued. So, uh, the governor on April 1st uh, issued his executive order mandating that the entire state get 25% overall conservation. And on the 18th of April, the state board released its first draft of the regulations, which set the city's goal at 20%. And so, in response to that, the city engaged the state board and uh, got the modification to the baseline and now the city as a result the city is going to have to meet a s additional 16 percent conservation so uh, which was adopted by the state board yesterday so this next slide this is to answer your question this is what the state board adopted just yesterday you can see nine different tiers uh, that were adopted uh, the state board set these tiers based on an urban water agency's uh, residential gallons per person per day use and uh, we are in tier number four so the, it's based on our three-month residential use between July and September of 2014. That's our baseline. And based on that baseline, we were down at 90.9 gallons per person per day on the residential side. So you can see we're right in the middle of Tier 4. Now, we uh, did take a look at ways to modify the baseline and see if we could advocate for uh, changes in the way the baseline was calculated so that the city could get down into tier three and get a little more recognition for all the conservation we've done over the years. But no matter how we uh, change the, the uh, baseline, we couldn't get out of tier four. So this is where we're going to probably end up uh, staying is in tier four. Next slide. So separately in response to this, as you all know, the governor issued his executive directive. Mayor. Uh, I'm sorry, the mayor issued his executive directive with a list of actions, essentially three main goals for the city. The first one was to reduce the city's gallons per person per day by 20% by 2017. Also redu to reduce the city's purchases of imported water from our wholesale water provider, the Metropolitan Water District, by 50% by 2024, and develop an integrated water strategy to develop lo local supplies. Next slide. This is uh, another, uh, this is in answer to your previous question on how we're doing. So. Um, this really gives you a feel for our all-in gallons per person per day use in the city over time. And the mayor's baseline was over on the left. The third blue line from the left is 131. That's the ED5 baseline. And this is how we're progressing on that baseline. Here we are now. We're down at 120, so we're doing pretty good. And uh, I'd like to highlight a little historical uh, fact. Back in the mid-'80s, uh, the city was using 170, 187 gallons for every person who lived in the city. That's, that's a pretty high number. Um, some of the cities in the Southland are, are still above 165. So the city, uh, over that, this period of time, that was about a 20-year period, uh, reduced its GPCD by 30. And then in the last drought in 2007, uh, we did some aggressive outreach and also implemented our outdoor watering restrictions, and that resulted in an additional 15 gallons per person per day shaved off our GPCD in just uh, seven years. Uh, the mayor has now asked us to reduce our GPCD by 27 uh, in just two and a half years. So our first measurement milestone on 85 is July 2015. Now, how does the... David, before you move yes. on, where, where did we ramp up the Department of Water and Power ramp up with the low flow uh, toilets, the low flow uh, shower heads. When, when did that sort of really get hot and heavy? That's all in the eight, late 80s, early 90s. So okay. when, you, when you see this drop right here, a lot of that is due to that low hanging fruit, which is, you know, those residential high flow toilets. And we did uh, pretty large incentives to the point where you had a little cottage industry at the time in the city where uh, people would come in and just replace your toilet for free and just take the rebate. And what about the incentives for, like, the high efficiency washers, uh, that, that sort of thing? Where, where did that sort of start? And those, those also started in the late 80s, early 90s. We started adding okay. those in. All right. So. So, so we can attribute a lot of the success, education, but some of the incentives that we provided in, the, in sort of the blue? That's right. This, these, the, the progress we made in blue really is for indoor plumbing. A, a lot of the indoor 
uh, water use efficiency devices that we've in, been incentivizing for all these years. And we've saturated the market with these things. So, you know, you go to the big box stores now, you can't buy a high flush toilet. You've got to buy an ultra low flush toilet. And most of the washing machines that you see on the market now are front loaders, which are very high efficiency compared to the old, you know, top loading style. So we, we really have transformed the market here. And we're hoping to do the same thing in, in the outdoors now. And that's really where our focus is currently, is outdoor. One thing I'd like to point out, so in that, between the second and third blue lines, that's where the water conservation ordinance was put in place and left in place at three days a week. And although we had, had, had backed off on the enforcement and a lot of the communication, uh, there was still that lingering effect that got us into this year 13, 14 as a starting point. So you did see a lingering effect of, of constant outdoor water conservation as well at that reduced three-day level by still a lot of the public. We had a little rebound, uh, but we were still sitting at around about a 16 to 17 percent residual conservation. Uh, be, between that, after that 2006, 2007 number. So. Now, I, I understand it's not going to line up perfectly, but so, so the, the, in, the indoor plumbing efficiency devices, then sort of the start of phase two, now the turf uh, buyback program starts really where? 2009. 2009. Okay, very good. But at that point, it was, uh, when it started, how much was it? It was, uh, was it a dollar yeah, square foot? It, yeah, and it started in summer of 2009. Right. In, in earnest, though, in the last two years, it's really taken off. Yes. The, those first couple of years, it really wasn't a lot of turf removal uh, participation. These last two years, it's really exploded. Sure. So at $3.75 a square foot, it really is sort of taken off here. So Absolutely. that's important, I, I guess, in terms of the next wave of conservation. We'll see what that meets out in terms of savings yes and I and I think we're probably not for all the work that's going on this year currently we're not seeing the savings yet from that because these are things that are in process when we start to hit the summer months and we see that water use reduction then we'll start to see the savings from that so a lot of what you're seeing currently it's it's some of last year's turf change out but it's also the increased messaging and and push on behalf of the, on the whole the whole city's efforts to try to remind everyone that we're at three-day week watering and start to police that again yeah, behavior change is really uh, where we really lean in times like this, where because behavior changes can be an immediate response, and uh, a lot of the incentive type programs do take time to take effect. Next slide. So, how are we doing uh, compared to the various targets that have been set for the city? So, we're currently at 120 GPCD. This little green dot right here. Uh, what you see here is the Metropolitan Water District uh, Phase Three allocation. That's where they currently are. Uh, in December, they may drop that lower, but we think that we can meet our met allocation. These are the targets that the governor is, uh, the mayor has set for us in red and the governor in blue. And so uh, since our, our targets for, th this is kind of an important date here, February 2016. I'll talk a little more about that in a minute, but uh, this is our strategy for getting to 16% by uh, February 2016 is to reduce our GPCD all the way down to 110 to meet the mayor's target and 109 to meet the governor's target. Let me cover it. So one, one thing to note that's important, so our goal is to get to 15% under the mayor's directive by July. And so with the governor putting us at 16%, we're dealing within a gallon a person a day difference. So we're talking essentially the path that we're on is the path that we need to remain on to meet uh, the state's requirements as well. Yeah, these, these differences between the governor and the mayor are really within the margin of error. Next slide. This is uh, our supply demand balance for this fiscal year. You can see that uh, this is a buildup of our supplies, uh, recycled water, local groundwater, LA aquatic water, our metropolitan water district allocation. Uh, we think if our demands remain where they are currently, we'll be able to have enough water to serve the full service demands of the city. Uh, we want to try to drive it down to this red line where we'll be quite a bit below uh, the total amount of water that we can. Uh, have access to if need be. Uh, the reason this block of water is so large is that the Metropolitan Water District allocation formula allows what's called a loss of local supply. So as hydrology affects the LA aqueduct system, we get a larger block of Metropolitan Water District water. And so that, that's uh, what happens here. Next slide. Uh, I'm going to talk very quickly through what we're doing uh, to respond to the drought. That was part of your question. You've seen some of this uh, late last year, so I'll go through it very quickly. Uh, what you see here is an expanded water conservation response unit team. We've got six members now. Uh, we've got car wraps, uh, just a few enforcement statistics since uh, 
January of 14, we've had 10,000 water uh, waste complaints. We've uh, issued about 8,000 letters of citations, but most people do respond positively, and we've only had to issue 27 monetary fines this year. Uh, these are our uh, considerable range of conservation rebates and incentive programs we offer. This isn't all inclusive, but this gives you some of the more popular ones. Uh, we do offer some free devices, shower heads, air, uh, faucet aerators, spray nozzles for residential and commercial customers are all free. And then these are some of the rebates that we offer shown here. Of course, our turf removal program is uh, really one of our big programs, and uh, that's 375 a square foot. A uh, couple statistics on that that are kind of interesting. Last year, uh, we removed 1.8 million square feet of turf. This year, we've removed already, just in the first nine months of the fiscal year, 5 million square feet of turf. Uh, we anticipate that uh, by the end of this year, uh, our all-in total amount that we've removed over the life of the program will be 25 million square feet. That's half of the governor's goal for the entire state. So we increased our outreach budget for conservation from two to four million dollars uh, this year, and uh, just to pump up the awareness of our ordinance and our rebate programs, and to try to encourage behavior change. Uh, we advertise in a variety of media: uh, bus tails, benches, shelters. You may have seen. We have uh, newspaper and radio ads. We're on social media, both Facebook and Twitter, and we're also in on television spots and in the movie theaters. Uh, we have, on April 9th, launched a, a new uh, Save the Drop program that was in partnership with the mayor's office, and you may have seen that uh, out recently. Uh, one other thing we're doing that's kind of innovative is uh, our Water Smart program. It's a pilot study of about 20,000 uh, single-family residential customers who get uh, tailored reports on their water use, and it shows how they compare their homes to similar size and climate uh, homes in their area and just to encourage them uh, to see how they're doing compared to other people. It also gives them ideas that are tailored to their water use on how they can conserve water and, and take advantage of our rebate programs. You can also you, asked can about... Can you spend a, a yes, little bit more time on the water pilot study? Yes, where, where, where is that? Because that's the other part that the motion speaks to, is, sure. is trying to help uh, our residents understand how, much, how many gallons per day they're consuming. I've done the math. I can figure out how many I'm doing. But how, how will that smart pilot get out to, uh, to, to, to residents, and how, how will you roll that out? Well, it in, the pilot ends in December, and so early next year we'll be at a decision point on where we take this program. And if, if we see the type of uh, conservation results that we think we'll see, hopefully at least 5%, then perhaps we'll make a decision to take this across our, our service territory. And this report essentially gives them the type of information you were just mentioning. Uh, it gives them really detailed information on, you know, how am I doing in my home compared to, you know, the Joneses next door. So that's uh, precisely what I'd like to see. Where are you doing it? It's not in my bill. It's already, roll it's already rolled out. These customers are al already uh, receiving these reports. What part of the city? Work? It's randomly across the city. We uh, did it. try not. I received it. It's very helpful. Okay. Well, it was very, very helpful, uh, user-friendly. Uh, I started asking myself, you know, what else can I do, considering where I saw myself compared to other yeah. neighbors. Um, is it bilingual? Is it multilingual? Is it? Can you use it bilingual? I, it can be. I'm not sure how many bilingual we needed to send it to. I'll have to check back on that. But we, it's a 20,000 uh, customer pilot program, and the idea is to randomly select them and then evaluate what our uh, water reduction was for those customers to see how then it would be cost effective to roll it out to all of our customers. So, so, so that year pilot will end this December. So when did you start that pilot? It, it started, you got the January, you should have got the welcome letter, and in February the first report started rolling out. I see. And so uh, you'll make, the current thinking is that you'll wait till December to make a decision on whether to bring it to scale? Yes. We're, we want to be able to explain to our board that and the management that this does make sense to do it is cost effective it does reduce our water use citywide by certain percentages and build a business case for it yeah. okay. and because water use varies over the year we wanted to make sure we got a year look at it because it changes your water use during the during the different uh, seasons yeah. yeah well you know what we when let's say our regular bills right now we get uh, we see our usage for past several months, but the only point of comparison is ourselves. And this allows us to, 
use a metric that we mm -hmm. compare against, like, how am I doing? You can't get that in a regular bill. I mean, am I using right. too much? Am I not? You just see, you're comparing yourself against yourself. So yes, last so like year... like households like you. Yeah, that's right. So um, it, it did, uh, I forget which one, but I was using more electricity than, or water than others, but it, it helped me say, well, how can I get there now? I want to be average. Yeah. You know, that's uh, we're all humans. We are, right. React and we have, we have a dedicated yeah. web portal for the customers that want yes. that more information for them to log into and even get more information yeah. than the report itself provides. And, yeah, you can get historical average use on the web portal and other information you might be interested and, in. And you don't have to be a pilot participant to do that. You do currently. Uh, you do. You do currently, currently because, again, we're trying to make sure when we look at the analysis, it's it's not skewed by any outside influences. All right. Well, so, so the thinking here was that we would ask you all to come back and sort of give us a sense for that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to want to do that far sooner because uh, I, I had not seen that before, and okay. that's terribly exciting because I all think right. that will give folks the ability to know where they're at in real time. You know, I, I was very excited when I figured out that I'm using about 40 gallons per person in my household. Um, but I only know that's good because of uh, my trip to Australia, being educated on sort of how many gallons and that sort of thing. This, I think, is, is, is very, very, very important. So um, we're going to have to uh, move that a lot sooner than later. Yeah. All right, I'm yeah. sorry, I interrupted. Uh, unless fine. my colleagues have questions on this page. Uh. Mr. Koretz? I, just, I have a question. Back up page, but you don't need to back up. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, MWD has a level three allocation, yes. but they certainly discussed very favorably moving to a level four. Um, and so it wouldn't shock me unless everybody responds in all the cities um, throughout Southern California that we hit a level four. Yes. So how do we do if we, if we wind up with a level four allocation and you know, two months so, from now, let's say. One of the reasons we put all these different restrictions on one chart is because it was important for us to know what was the, mo the most stringent driving factor for us. And so it appears at this time that certainly the mayor's directive and the governor's mandate, uh, which are, you know, very close together, are really the driving factors. So uh, a level four, Dave, the line is about 120-ish? Yes, we're, we'd, we'd be at 120, uh, Councilman Kretz, if we were at a level four at right. Metropolitan. Right, so, so that would still be less stringent than the other, the other drivers that we have. So, so it's, it's right at the edge, yeah. and obviously we, assuming we go, start moving downward. Yeah, assuming we go down and not up, we wouldn't be in the penalty. And do you know what a level five would put us at? Uh, it's going to cut another 5% another off your demand. So you, you figure it's going to be at least another. What's It'll that? cross those lines. Another It'll cross those lines somewhere. So we'll be down. We'll be down in the teens. Yeah. So you know, by the, probably around the mayor's. Level five. Mayor's. By the time they did it, it looks like we'd probably be below that again. Uh, if, if, if if it happened, happened in, yes, because the Metropolitan Water District goal will have to meet that by the end of the year. So if it if the end of the of next fiscal year. All right. So we're probably okay based on yeah. what we're in. It appears that the met pricing is not going to, won't be the driver for us unless they do something drastic. That's correct. Very good. Yep. Uh, one thing to put on the water smart study, so the, the everywhere they've done those, the experiences the... I'm sorry, Marty, Mr. LeBonge has a question. Yes, no, sir. no, he can finish, Mr. Adams. You're the head of the Department of Water. <laughs> uh, no, please. Go no, I saw Chinatown. I know the scene. <laughs> uh -huh. No, I'm teasing you, Marty. Thank you for the water. I just want to, I think education is so important for the public on where the water comes from, how much we use. What I really find interesting lately, in the, at least in the media outreach, is there's, you know, like they're going after cows now because cows take uh, 1,200 gallons, 1,200 gallons a pound? A pound of beef, yeah. A pound of beef. Man, that's an amazing number. So all that, you know, is very important. I just want to see it not to be a dividing factor for our state, but a unifying factor as we go forward. And the other thing I would want to say, because I know you're doing a group, it'd be interesting to see just for, I think, a spirit, because they used to do this years ago. Does anybody remember the Milk Bowl? The Milk Bowl was the third game every year, L.A. City High Schools, and you raise money for 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 milk. I mean, it's that long ago. It'd be interesting to see either by region or by zip code on how is 90039 doing, totally, you know, from a community spirit. Would you think about that? Would you just think about that? How is 9049? How is 90065? How is 91 whatever the others are? You know, I think it would be good just for, because this is not going to end right. soon, correct? Correct. This is maybe a thing we're going to live with. And I think there's a a spirit of trying to work. I do remember the energy crisis in Los Angeles where we turned lights out. 
when we turned street lights out, I don't know, half the polls and the Wilshire specials, you know, there was a spirit. So I think there's something to do. And it is uh, important that it's, it's do some test groups like walk up, can you understand it? Because sometimes I can't even understand my DWP bill. You know, so, uh, but I thank you for the water that we have and I thank you for the power that we get. But I just, education is so important of, uh, to the, our customers and maybe even have an outreach. Uh, I see your mobile team force, but just at community things where there's a, the uh, Natural History Museum had a, has a big semi, have a small like vehicle that people could tell what's going on, where it comes from, uh, and how we got to preserve it. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. LaVange, thanks. Okay, you've also asked about uh, how we've been doing uh, the projected water savings to meet the mayor and governor's target, and this is designed to give you an answer to that question. So uh, we've dropped our G GPCD for fiscal year 13-14 uh, from 131 down to 120, as I mentioned before. How we did that is about 4,000 acre feet a year in new rebate savings. And this included 6.3 million square feet of turf. So that, that helped us get down here. Uh, beyond that 4,000 acre feet of new rebate and turf removal savings, we've got about 41,000 acre feet of additional um, behavior change. And that was through our outreach campaigns and uh, education campaign and our ordinance restriction enforcement. So to reach the mayor and governor's targets, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do more of the same. We're, gonna, we're projecting to achieve another 6,000 acre feet a year of water efficient appliance installation and turf removal, and also another 62,000 acre feet of savings from behavior change. And that's how we plan to drop from where we are today to meet the uh, governor and mayor's targets by February of 2016. And all of that effort will get us to what you've seen before is our vision for Los Angeles, which is to move away from a lawn culture into a California friendly uh, landscape garden culture. And uh, we think that uh, that is doable. We've we've uh, gotten the indoor plumbing uh, moved away from the old style to the new style, and we anticipate we'll be able to be successful in the outdoor irrigation uh, and landscape as well. Mr. LeBond. Some of the biggest uh, landscape areas are that of what was the red car, or parkways, large parkways. And I just find it, how are we going to deal with the large parkways if you remove the green, because it's a very long strip that's not maintained, very... Uh, very limited. I, this is a term, I don't know if it's appropriate, but it's mow and blow, or I think is what they do, or, or, or blow and go, or whatever the thing is, if just trying to go through an area. I think of the parkways of the city, and what is your aspect there? Because that's a nice picture, but I don't think that could be maintained in a, in a large area. Huntington Drive, what's Huntington Drive going to do uh, out you know, to the city limits? So, what have, you, have you had that discussion? This is one of the things that the uh, water cabinet is looking at. It's a you know, conglomeration of the different city agencies that, that touch water in some way. And so one of the things that, that is being looked at is both uh, what should be done on, park, on uh, parkways in front of homes and also what opportunities are there for medians in the city. So it's something because it, this does affect other city departments and, and the kind of maintenance costs that they may incur. So this, so looking at these options and what would make sense. And certainly we do rebate other city departments to help pay for changeovers, but we have to do it in a way that the city can maintain it. And, and so, uh, you know, just because it's California friendly doesn't mean it's maintenance free. So it'd be a different type of maintenance. And so we'd have to make sure that the city is geared up to, to do that change. Yeah, and also the two on the parkway issue there, ADA requirement, you know, to make sure that it's clear. And also, is the visibility triangle mean anything to anybody anymore? Because sometimes the growth comes right up to the intersection right. uh, and you can't see and then the hazard for children or others when they get to the intersection. This is all the big challenge. You know, it's a very big challenge that you have, but uh, I, I just wanted to make sure on the on the big parkways, whether it's San Vicente or uh, all the way over Huntington Drive, Vermont Avenue, which should have a reclaim line in there, but you're a million dollars short, so I got to find you a million dollars somewhere. So, okay, thank you, Mr. Kuretz. Yeah, I was just wondering if we have developed the expertise to uh, train our staff on handling of drought tolerant plants as we. As we look at uh, putting drought tolerant plants into uh, the medians, have we looked at 
training our staff? Do we have that expertise yet? We, we've yeah. been working with uh, the CLCA, it's an irrigation or organization, and been sending um, our DWP staff, and including our DWP landscapers, uh, to this. We also uh, work with uh, some of the community organizations like Theater Pain Foundation mm -hmm. on handling of, of uh, California friendly or low water using plants. Um, a lot of our gardeners have already been doing this for quite a few years. So has the Rec and Park uh, group and organization. Um, besides just looking at reducing water use and putting in more efficient irrigation, we've also been working with Rec and Parks and the uh, Watershed Protection Division on the more holistic watershed approach of capturing storm water, uh, making you know more garden uh, water friendly or, or uh, rain rain garden gardens that uh, actually just use what Mother Nature provides for that uh, irrigation. And um, we also are working even on a statewide level with the irrigation industry on coming up with simpler systems for our customers to understand, especially, you know, you go to that smart controller, your weather-based controller, you know, nobody wants to touch it. You set it and forget it. Well, we're really working hard statewide, and uh, DWP is at the table with them on how we can make this easier for customers to understand. So it's not gone unnoticed, and we are making steps towards that. But, uh, you know, toilets and every and the indoor plumbing, we've been at it for 30 years. We've just started the outdoor irrigation, the outdoor landscaping, and the outdoor water use efficiency, you know. And so we've still got a long ways to go, and we've got a lot to learn. But we're also outreaching to the public on this very issue. So we're trying to educate our own landscapers, but we have free classes for the public. So if you're a public member and you don't know anything about these type of plants, we have free classes out in Van Nuys, also in downtown on the weekends that you can participate in for free. They're very well uh, attended. Uh, they're pretty much booked up whenever we do them. Um, also, we have a landscape website that you can go to now and you can get some of these questions answered about what type of a plant palette would work in my yard and what type of maintenance would these plants require and where can I get these plants. And that's, so, that's a great service. Do we do we publicize that yes, anywhere? We do. do we publicize it the bills? Mm -hmm. yes, in the do. bills, in newsletters that we send out? Yes. And even at all the events we have, we have this information there. And we've got our new okay. calendar that we have and all this information about landscaping. We keep pushing that message. And Great. it links to the residential parkway uh, guidelines, which Absolutely. is really important That's so good. you know what's already accepted and you don't have to apply for a permit. Right. Mr. LaBanche. I just forgot to mention Highland Avenue in Hancock Park. So uh, I would hate to see, you know, what you want to do there. If not green and want to consult with the community, and I think this will go on past my time here, so consult with whoever the council person, whoever she or he may be, post my time. Uh, and the other thing, too, there's over a 1,000 dead trees in Griffith Park uh, because of the drought, and they're taking them out because of fire. But also, I wouldn't want to see us, and I'll put this on the table right now, Mr. Chairman, I want some exemption for wrecked parks. Because many of our people who live in uh, densely populated areas, their only green space is that of the park. So there should be some consideration there. You know, there should be some consideration for the large public parks that people are in that we don't let them go all brown because what's, you know, I think it should be something that we got to look at. And is the East Valley Water Reclamation Plant in operation yet? The, uh, the plant's in operation, the pipeline to the Sepulveda Basin, Reckon Parks customers is in operation, yes. But you but that but you got to get to the East Valley on that too, right? you got more to do, right? We have more to do to get to yeah. working spread for groundwater research. Good, that's a big thing. Okay, but let's, could, could I just get a friendly second to something on so that? Actually, I think we have some information for you on uh, how it is that we're dealing with Reckon Parks, Penny. Absolutely. There's a uh, current in the water conservation ordinance itself. It does identify large landscapes and alternative means of compliance. And we've worked since we implemented and started uh, in 2009, the two days a week watering or the three days a week watering. Right. We implemented and worked with Reckon Parks on that. Reckon Parks is a partner with us and they do have an option to water on other days other than the assigned odd and even days for their park facilities. We also have an MOU that we've had with them. Uh, it's going on seven years now. And we provide funding for them to upgrade all their parks with efficient irrigation, putting California-friendly landscaping, and also fund bringing them recycled water up. I got that, but there's a thousand trees that have died. Right. We're a lot to the drought and the beetle. So I just say if they maybe need three days a week to water yeah. instead of two days a week or whatever you said there. I'm just saying let's look at it and, and see what it is around. Maybe ask, you call, you call it a cabinet? 
that water cabinet with the record parks is in on it? Yes, they're part yeah, of it. Yeah, just so, well, what is dying? Now, let's not forget that some dying. Some people like to see some die, like a tree, because they're not a tree person, you know. So let's we'll work, we'll work with the record parks. Thank you, that. Marty. Mr. Kruitz. Yeah, just to follow up on that, um, I think people are, are watering their lawns less, or they've stopped watering their lawns, but I, I don't think there's awareness in the general public that we've got so little rain that people do need to keep watering their trees to some degree. Right. Uh, do we give any guidance? Number one, do we give any guidance as to how much that might be? Do we help people have any understanding of that and how they can do it in a conservation-minded way? And number two, along the lines of what Mr. Labonge was saying, have we looked at our own city trees and how to make sure they get enough water to survive while not wa overwatering our landscaping? Well, um, with Rec and Parks, uh, we have been talking to them, and they do have some partners that they have that go out and water the trees specifically. Tree People, I know, is one of those partners. Um, so they do get exemptions from the ordinance and can water during sp hours that are, are not allowed for watering. So that exemption has been made for them. In addition, in areas where they can go out and cap the irrigation in some and can leave the irrigation on for the trees, that's a second option for them. And thirdly, tree people just spoke today, and they have actually a fact sheet, and we're going to get a hold of that and get that uploaded onto our website to provide more information to our customers. Can we put it in the bills, too, because that seems to be the easiest, most direct way to get that information, and we might save a few hundred right. trees well, in the city by letting people have that information that they, they need to keep watering their trees, because nobody's used to having to water trees in Los Angeles, but I think we're there now. Absolutely. And uh, where they can reuse their shower water while they're waiting to get hot, we'll definitely put that in there as a tip for them to Thank take you. it Thanks out and put it on the I tree. Do that. I do, do I that. know My you lemon do tree's that. looking fantastic, by the way. Why don't we get back to the item before us here? Oh, the last time. thing I just got to say, because I got to go and I had to do it, get the uh, weather people, Vera Jimenez, Fritz Coleman, all of them to be ambassadors and then ask that you don't need to water today or tomorrow. You know, come up with some scheme. Make them part of your thing, and they'll do it. Okay. Very Thank good. You. So it looks like we are on our way to make the 16% mandate, uh, the 20% goal. Uh, so let's go ahead, uh, Mr. Uh, Labonge. Why don't you make a motion here to uh, note and file the DWP report and request that the department report back. Let's make it uh, 30 days instead of 90 on the Water Smart pilot study and the efforts to target uh, uh, single-family customers to reduce their water use. I make that motion, but I wanted 29 days because I'll still be here in 29 days. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> make it Fair 29 enough. days. That's a, the amendment is accepted. Mr. Weezer seconds. That passes <laughs> unanimously. And since we have all of you here, why don't we go ahead, Mr. Prieto, and take up the items that were previously heard here, uh, such as item number one. The recommendation there was that the committee uh, approved the CAO's recommendations to adopt the 28th Supplemental Resolution and 17th Supplemental Resolution, including various departments, documents required to execute the transitions, transactions, authorize the CAO to take certain actions required to manage the transactions, including cost of issuances, and authorize the CAO to make technical changes to implement the intent of the council and mayor. I move. Very good. Mr. Weezer seconded. That is out unanimously. Item two uh, is the Osmos Utilities Service Agreement. The recommendation is to approve the department's request for authority to execute an agreement in Osmos Utilities in providing and continuing maintenance and support for the Osmos proprietary software. I move. Very I good. And very, this is like appropriations in the legislature. This is great. <laughs> Any objection? Hearing and seeing none, that item is deemed approved. Item number three, the Emergency Water Conservation Plan. The recommendation is to approve the report by DWP requesting the adoption of the amendment to the city's emergency water conservation plan ordinance to create a two-day-a-week watering schedule, not to take effect just yet, it's just changing the ordinance, and request the city attorney to prepare the final ordinance and to submit it to the city council for review. Is that moved? Very good. Moved by Mr. LeBanche, seconded by Mr. Huizar. That item is out. That brings us to item number four. That's the one that we've done already, and we're now on item number Five. Okay. Uh, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Kim O'Hara, who is our manager Let's of legislation. Let's have the CLA re uh, read it into okay. the record. Sure. Item number five. Motion Fuentes, a fair relative to request in the Department Water and Power and the Bureau of Sanitation. You know, uh, thank you for reminding me. Item seven was already heard. It was held on the desk. Let's go ahead and oh. Mr. Weezer moves it. 
Mr. Koretz? Seconds. Seconds. That item is also out. Okay. Thank you. Certainly. Item number five. Number five. Farm Water and Power and Bureau Sanitation Report relative to the coordinated legislative strategy as it pertains to Proposition 1 grant formation implementation process. Uh, okay. Mr. Chair, item number six is very similar to this item. Would you like to consider them both That's jointly? That's a great idea. Why don't we go ahead and take five and six, and uh, I will remember that there are speaker cards on that as well. Uh, item number six, Mr. Pietro, is? Is. Motion corrects we are relative to request the Department of Water and Power to prepare and submit timely application for Chapter 8 funding associated with the Proposition 1 funds as well. Very good. Welcome back, Mr. Adams. Thank you. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dave Pettyjohn here who can uh, introduce uh, this item and what we're doing for our Prop 1 funding. Now before I get started, I'd like to introduce Kim O'Hara. She's our manager of our legislation and grants funding uh, group, and she is the lead for LADWP on Prop 1 funding. Uh, also with us uh, at the table is Mr. Sharam Karagani. Sharam is the Director of Watershed Protection Division over at the LA Sanitation. Thank you. Uh, we're here today to talk about item five, which is relating to the coordinated legislative strategy for Prop 1 funding by the city, and item six, which is focusing on engaging in chapter eight of Prop 1 on how we can get money from surface and groundwater storage projects. Uh, this chart shows you the final result. Uh, of the bond efforts this year. It was a, ended up being a pared down $7.5 billion bond uh, from the old Cogdale bond, which was uh, over $12 billion. And uh, the measure contains significant funding for the types of projects and programs that are important to the city. Uh, some of these include our water sh wastewater, um, water recycling, groundwater remediation and sustainability, uh, urban water enhancement, watershed restoration, water conservation, and stormwater management. Uh, the bond passed overwhelmingly th with a bipartisan vote in the legislature and also uh, it passed by two-thirds of the vote uh, of the people in November. So uh, this, uh, essentially the second slide we're going to show you here is uh, essentially a two-track process. So after the passage of Prop 1, you've got the program guidance development which is going on and also you've got the budget process which is going on. The governor issued his budget. And all, once those two things happen and you develop the guidelines and you've got the money, you get the program applications are accepted and then the funding awards are made. And so we are going to engage in essentially four different tasks. Uh, and I'm going to talk about each one of these. We're going to monitor and engage the state budget process. We're going to monitor and engage on the new legislation that's related to Prop 1 that uh, continues to roll out. Uh, we're going to participate in trying to reach out and educate uh, our representatives in the state legislature uh, and their staff on the city's water-related needs and priorities for Prop 1. And we're going to engage finally in the guideline development, which is a very important piece of this. So the Governor Brown released his budget proposal for fiscal year 15-16 on January 10th, and this is what it looks like. Uh, this table shows all of his uh, allocations uh, and some key funding for chapters for the city uh, in the governor's 15-16 uh, budget. Uh, one is water conservation funding in Chapter 17. That was $23.2 million. Another is water recycling funding in Chapter 9, and that's $131 million. And also $600,000 for uh, Chapter 10, which is uh, groundwater funding for groundwater contamination remediation. This is essentially to staff the program up and develop the guidelines. Um, a revised state budget proposal is going to be issued later this month. And that's all of our, the city agencies are going to be working together to review the May revise and work with the city to determine if uh, we need to advocate for additional or expanded funding for this fiscal year. The third thing, uh, the legisl new legislation, uh, we're engaging in new Prop 1 legislation that comes out that impacts Prop 1. There's a number of bills we're monitoring. Uh, there's accelerated funding for disadvantaged communities that's uh, being proposed. There's some recent draft uh, relief, uh, drought relief legislation. Those are Assembly Bills 91 and 92 that we're looking at. And um, those are areas where we, we think we can have uh, an impact. Also, on the education and outreach side, the uh, city has been uh, reaching out to administrative officials and state legislatures to, in the state legislature to discuss the city's needs for Prop 1 funding. And the various city departments, we're going to uh, support 
these efforts by providing updated fact sheets and information on key projects. I'd like to give an example of the type of information we're going to be providing. This slide shows a graphic on our San Fernando groundwater basin project that has been developed uh, for distribution at the state level. And as you can see, um, in the early years, we're in essentially some project development dollars are going to be spent, but the real uh, big dollars come with the construction, and that's not going to hit until uh, 2018, 2019. So it's going to be important for us to make sure that the large dollars in Prop 1 don't start rolling out before the city is ready to take advantage of those dollars. So this is a document that we're using to educate our uh, representatives at the state level and also to advocate when the guidance is developed so that the money comes out when we can take advantage of it. And uh, this is one very big area of uh, need for the city. It also is a key to the city getting its essentially fair share of bond funding. And as you know, 10% of the state's population is in the city of Los Angeles. It's a $7.5 billion bond. If the city is going to break even on the tax dollars that the city will contribute to that bond, uh, the city has to get about $750 million from uh, Prop 1. Uh, this is a project that is going to cost the city about $600 million. Uh, the Prop 1 funding allows you a 50% match, so this could potentially get $300 million of that goal that, uh, that has been set for us by the ratepayer advocate of getting at least $750 million. So it will be a very big piece of uh, our success in Prop 1 if we're successful in getting that money. The last thing is guideline development. Uh, thus far, the state agencies have begun to release draft guidelines, and they're having workshops and accepting comments. Uh, the various city departments with applicable projects uh, will have to engage and review these guidelines where applicable. An example of where we've been doing this is in Chapter 9 on the water recycling projects. We work very closely with LA Sanitation to coordinate our comment letters that were submitted to the state board in April on, on that chapter. So. Uh, we're working to engage on those guideline developments. Uh, we also, with uh, respect to item six of your agenda, uh, the staff has been monitoring the state uh, California Water Commission's meetings on Chapter 8, and this is for surface storage um, and groundwater storage projects. Uh, Chapter 8 provides funding for public benefits associated with surface and groundwater storage projects. Uh, there are, however, a couple of caveats on that. Uh, chapter that make it a bit challenging for us. One is that at least 50% of the total public benefits funded uh, must be ecosystem improvements. Uh, the other is that projects must uh, also provide measurable improvements to the Delta ecosystem and its tributaries. Um, so the Department of Water Resources staff is currently working on the draft uh, regulations for this program and the public comment period is expected to open in July of this year and, and we plan to be uh, engaged in that process. Uh, what our strategy is, is we're going to review those draft regulations for, Prop 8, uh, for Chapter 8 and provide co a comment letter uh, to support Chapter 8 funding being made available for groundwater storage and remediation projects such as the one in the San Fernando Valley. So a list of potential city projects that are eligible for Prop 1 funding. We're currently working to develop that list with uh, the LA Sanitation. And uh, we plan on submitting to you a completed uh, project list uh, for your committee's uh, review and approval uh, here later uh, next week or the following week. Uh, the last thing is uh, some of the funding options. This is something that came up uh, that we were requested to report on. And this gives you an idea of how we plan to optimize uh, our funding for various projects that we'll fund. Uh, and do that in a way that has minimum impact on our ratepayers. Uh, you can see here that grants and Prop 1 funding is really just one piece of how we optimize our ratepayer benefits for various projects. We also uh, reach out to various partnerships with uh, not only other city departments but other uh, agencies outside the city that can help us fund projects. Uh, we work very closely with uh, LA County on projects. We also uh, achieve a lot of low interest loans to reduce our cost of projects. We're planning on doing uh, securitization efforts to lower our, our cost of capital. Uh, also, um, of course, the, the bonds like, like Prop 1 will help us. And then uh, also potential responsible parties who uh, could potentially uh, contribute to projects like the San Fernando Basin uh, cleanup 
will also reduce uh, the cost to our ratepayers and, of course, uh, water rates as well. So with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have on uh, items five and six. Very good. I see that the ratepayer is here. Uh, Dr. Pickle, would you mind joining us? Because I think it's important for us to uh, sort of keep our eye on the prize here in terms of what our fair share of return on Prop 1 funds would be. I know that uh, Mr. Pettyjohn mentioned uh, sort of 10 percent, but you had previously sort of shared with us your thoughts. Can you let us know what you think in terms of what it is that we should be seeking? Uh, our calculation of the break, even based on population, was about $700 million. So about a little bit less than 10 percent of the $7.5 billion bonding. Sure. And, and while I, you know, can appreciate that number, I think sort of need is also important because if some of our goals are to make sure that we lessen the, the amount of water that we p depend on from Northern California, we should really shoot for the stars. So what, what is it that you think back of the envelope, the list of ask is going is, is to be? I know that you're formulating your, um, so, sort of your, your, your calculations, but how much are we going to go after and, and what does the legislative strategy look like? Because I think there's a lot of real expertise uh, these days uh, around the city council horseshoe in terms of how uh, it works up there. I think it'd be a real shame if we, we weren't sort of present and visible in terms of what it is that we're shooting for. So tell us a little bit about your strategy. Well, uh, thank you for, for that offer because uh, I think we're going to need your help in this. Uh, I think the first step is the, is the right step and that's the one your committee has asked for and that's to get a complete detailed listing of all the projects that the city departments feel can potentially qualify in each chapter of Prop 1. We're putting that together. Uh, once we have that list, the next step is to make sure that when the guidelines comes out, come out that those projects do qualify under those guidelines. So it'll be very important for the project managers and those who know those projects intimately uh, to make sure that when the guidelines come out that their projects that are on that list uh, actually qualify under the guidelines as the guidelines roll out. Now the way that you affect those guidelines and the guideline development frankly is, is through the legislature and uh, you know help from the city in affecting that is going to be very key to us being qualified to compete against other agencies. Uh, of course it is a competition. Uh, when the bond came out, the city felt at the time that we had projects like the San Fernando Basin Cleanup Project w w that could compete very fairly with, with other um, agencies across the state. And so we didn't ask for uh, any favor uh, favorable treatment. We just wanted to compete on a level playing field. Uh, we think that uh, our projects uh, can compete with any projects anywhere in the state. And as long as the guidelines don't uh, preclude uh, our projects, we think, will will do well. But, but uh, we're, we're not waiting until the guidelines are established. We're out there now advocating for and trying to shape those guidelines. Yes, that's right. And, that, and, and that's really what you have to do. You, you have to be engaged in the guideline development process. If, if you're not, the guidelines uh, can be developed in a way that makes it difficult for you to compete. And what does our advocacy team look like these days? Because sometimes we retain folks. Sometimes we have in-house people. In my time in the legislature, I saw a lot of sort of uh, mutations of, of Los Angeles's representation. What does our team look like right now in the legislature? Well, we do we do have a lobbying group that helps us in, in Sacramento uh, to reach out to our legislators. Uh, we have a group that worked very carefully with us on Prop One, and so uh, it was a very broad coalition of LA legislators who uh, represent us in the state. This is one of the only times that we've really gotten almost our entire delegation behind an issue. And so we don't think that it's going to be a limited group of LA uh, representatives at the state level that will help us. We think that we can keep that broad-based coalition together uh, as an advocacy group, and, and we plan to do that. And as important as the legislature is, the regulatory bodies are, I, I think, sort of the most important right now at this stage of the game. Who, who, who's who's uh, advancing our, our positions with those with those different agencies? We have very good working relationships with, say, the state board. Uh, the state board has a, a lot of input in some of the guidance and some of the chapters. Uh, so we uh, really do leverage our relationships uh, with the state board members that we uh, engage with on a regular basis. And, uh, we plan to continue to do that. Okay. It just seems to me that that really is sort of the place and the point that we should begin to attack with our advocates. Separate and aside from the legislature, folks really need to hone in on the, the, those bodies um, just because they, they will um, 
they will craft things, and, and we need to make sure that they craft things that are favorable to Los Angeles. Colleagues, any questions? Mr. Koretz? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for also hearing uh, item six along with it. And uh, you've asked excellent questions, so uh, much of what I was going to say has already been discussed. Uh, I, I do want to drill down on what our discussions have been like on regulations and rulemaking to date. How, how involved are we? How, how are we involved? What are, are our lobbyists engaged already? Well, in terms of Chapter 8, what we have been doing is monitoring the discussions at the California Water Commission and, you know, hearing what their discussions about some of these key statutory provisions and how they're interpreting it. Um, at the point where the guide, draft guidelines are released, we expect that we will engage, you know, maybe more directly and definitely put comments in. In terms of the Chapter 9 guidelines, the recycled water guidelines, we participated in, you know, public meetings. We worked with LA Sanitation. But in that case, those guidelines were... Um, springboarding off of an existing program. So there, there had been a program in place for a while. They weren't developing those, those guidelines from scratch. So there was no regulation involved on that. So, so we, ha we have been eight, engaging. Should we not be, rather than just monitoring, should we not be putting in our own two cents before the guidelines even come out? Um, you know, I think, I think at this point, because the discussions at the California Water Commission have been starting up and they're really talking about definitions, we haven't you know, felt comfortable at this point engaging, but I think as those discussions continue, we can engage more directly on that. Yes. Uh, I, too soon for a comment letter. Well, we did also. Uh, actually, we, we did send in some comment letters on Chapter Nine, the recyc for the recycled water projects. Uh, both the LA DWP and LA Sanitation, we worked together to coordinate our letters, but we both submitted uh, letters on that uh, Chapter Nine. What, what about eight? Uh, so far, the guidance on eight is. Right. The, the regulation on eight is due in July. But I will say that they have convened um, a stakeholder group that includes um, trade organizations that we do participate in. And I also believe that Metropolitan is a member of that stakeholder group talking about the storage program. So um, we can definitely, you know, engage through them and continue to monitor. And uh, when we get some clarity on, on some of these interpretations, we can, we can talk directly. Absolutely. And... Uh on, on your chart for starting to spend some of those monies uh, to restore the basin, um, the amount for this year was pretty tiny. Does that not include the $20 million that Met has agreed to to kick in to start work on that? And if not, is it because we haven't been able to get our, our labor partners to agree to let that happen? Well, I'll let Marty answer that one. Well, the... How much we can spend this year, uh, and that you know, there may be some room to recover. One of the issues, and we had a, a meeting about a month and a half ago with the uh, Department of Drinking Water. It's now under the State Water Board, and we have a regular coordination meeting. And so, one of the things that was that was uh, made clear to us is that you know they have three different state agencies that are developing different parts of the guidelines, and they're all at different stages of of where they are at and different and different deadlines. And so, uh, there are some guidelines that they say won't be out for a number of months, and some that'll be out uh, sooner. So, um, so part of the reason for the, the varied levels of participation is that in some cases, uh, the state isn't organized yet as to how they're going to move forward. So we are absolutely engaging at every opportunity there, there is and when that opportunity becomes available. So as those, those chances you know, become more, more available to us and these other issues that are just starting to get their feet, we will, we will be involved. Um, there's, uh, you know, with, this, with the near-term projects, there's... Uh, uh, certainly not a lot of money out there in all the right areas for us this year. Um, uh, we, we definitely are, are looking at all the opportunities. Uh, one of the things the state's looking at, and and this, this is all where still the, the agencies that actually have to administer the money are looking at how they're going to deal with this. Um, for instance, um, under low interest loans, st the state revolving fund has been a boon for LA. We're the biggest player in the state revolving fund of administering federal money coming to the state. And so we've gotten over $850 million in no and low interest loans from the state. So that, that represents over a 30 year lifespan of $500 million interest savings to our rate payers. So that's that much less money we need in water rates by participating in that program. And so they expect that, that when the, they've finished how to apply for these bonds, 
some of those programs will follow the model of the state revolving fund. And one of the things they said is that they may just say, give us your project and we'll find the best way to fund it. And it may, you may not specifically apply for a prop one. You may, you may just apply for funding and they'll put it through their state processes. So even at the state level, they're looking at what are their pool of resources. And it's almost like if you go to say, I want to get a loan and they go, oh, I got this vehicle and this vehicle and this way. And they look for the best one that fits you. And so it's leaving a little uncertain at the state level how they're going to, you know, when you put an application, are you applying for a certain fund or are you applying for help and they'll decide how that help looks. And so this is, so there's a lot of unknowns right now. And so at the same time, they're trying to write the rules and we need to make sure that the rules that our, that our projects qualify. Because if they say shovel ready, that makes a big difference whether shovel ready means CEQA complete or, or where you're at because a lot of projects that you know may not be ready to actually go to construction and so that becomes a, a real critical issue in the rule writing and then at the same time the process of applying um, so it's, do you qualify and then when you put your application in what are you applying for and and is it clear and and then the state may make the decision how you get the money so we we have been in the past applying for everything we thought would be applicable at a state level hopefully um, they're going to streamline the process to look more like the state revolving fund process, which we've gotten very good at as a city in competing for, and we and we uh, know how to how to how to move with that process. But we'll continue to apply for everything we possibly can. But again, the projects have to be at this, this point that they meet whatever criteria is in existence at the time. And one last question: um, If for some reason we weren't able to access uh, these bond funds, do we have a backup plan for? how we could restore uh, the aquifer? So right now, in terms of the San Fernando Valley Aquifer, um, you know, it's, it's a big price tag project. And so there's a, a number of, of avenues for money. Uh, certainly, we're hoping that the bond will pay for half of the project, and then the question is about the other half. Um, uh, we have, uh, we're working with the EPA and the identified polluters uh, to contribute toward the cleanup of the, uh, of the basin. One of the key factors is to make sure that any money that's contributed does qualify as part of our matching funds, because there's a question whether it qualifies or not, which would affect how much money we could get from the state. And then we're also uh, are working toward a, a joint powers authority uh, with the city of Burbank. It's the, the securitization piece, and that's the avenue to get off-balance sheet funding uh, in concert with another agency. That was uh, uh, per Assembly Bill 8, AB 850 that uh, uh, Assemblyman uh, Nazarian uh, put in place and, and worked with us on. And that was to allow water projects to compete for cheaper financing by having an off-balance sheet, which ultimately means it'd be an, a new line on the bill, which would add, unfortunately, to the confusion, but ultimately would lower the water bill significantly by, by reducing the amount of money we had to collect to fund those projects. So we're always interested in the cheapest vehicle possible. Um, there's even been looked at things such as public-private partnerships and private funding. Um, the problem in California is that private funding cannot take advantage of tax-free bonds. And tax-free bonds, uh, so it makes it very difficult. But at this point in the federal government, the president is looking at, a, at, at taking away the ability to have utility tax-free bonds, which would greatly affect the people who buy bonds that we use to invest in our projects. And so uh, we want to make sure, we're also trying to make sure that, that we don't lose that as a vehicle to move forward because it would make financing our projects more expensive. So we're, we're trying to play on all these levels at the same time uh, and, and looking at this to always get the cheapest financing. Our goal is to deliver the projects that we need to with the least amount of investment from our rate payers that we have to make. So that's, that's our goal at all times. Very good. So let's go ahead and um, continue this item uh, and ask that um, you all come back as soon as you have finalized your uh, report with uh, DWP and the Bureau of Sanitation. Very good. There is, uh, I'm sorry, before we continue that item, there are two speaker cards. Uh, Dr. Tom Williams and uh, Angelica Gonzalez on this item. Mr. Chair, will we also be continuing item six too since we held them? Yeah, uh, both items five and six. Uh, we will continue Great. as soon as we're done with um, speaker. Sir. Oh. Ms. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Angelica. I am the conservation program manager for the Angeles chapter here at the Sierra Club. And on behalf of the Sierra Club, I do urge uh, the committee to adopt the motion proposed by Councilmember um, Koretz and Wiesar 
Active participation by the Department of Water and Power in California Water Commission's regulatory development to implement Chapter 8 on the Proposition 1 water bond passed last November will make the difference between whether $2.7 billion is distributed to benefit all Californians, including Angelinos, or just a few special interests. Those very politically powerful interests led by some large agriculture entities are intent on capturing the funding for early work on three development um, in California, Northern California dams. These projects will likely never get built simply because they don't pencil out with huge public subsidies. Through the regulatory process, the California Water Commission will be specifically defining what sort of storage projects are best qualified to receive the $2.7 billion. Sierra Club supports using the funds for projects that produce great, the greatest environmental benefit. Given the committee and city council's overall interest in restoring the San Fernando Basin, it makes sense that LADWP to actively engage in California Water Commission's regulatory process. To ensure that restoring the basin will be eligible for funds, doing so will be good for the environment, local water, availability, and the economy. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Dr. Williams? Dr. Tom Williams, uh, Sierra Club Angeles Chapter Water Committee and others. And general support. The central issue is all of the chapters, I think we represent every chapter within Prop 1. So uh, how much money can we get? What do you need from the public in order to get that money for the city of Los Angeles and the water users for Department of Water and Power? There's only one water. We have to use it preciously. And we have to use it mm, as well as we can within our basin. There's a real issue with the San Fernando Valley, but there are also other groundwater resources within the area. I'd highly recommend that you have DWP provide a web page for project proposals from the public and also to identify those representatives within the state legislature and other organizations, boards and commissions that might be best mm, uh, talked to. So we're trying to help, trying to get the right thing for the city of Los Angeles and our groundwater resources, which will be a lot cheaper than building a storage facility in Shasta County. Thank you. Very good. We'll move to a public comment now. Dr. Tom Williams. Okay, next page. Central issue, are we in a new norm? Uh, one of the slides said a new normal. Maybe. We know that the climate has changed. Is it global warming? Do, do we really care? But it's a new norm, and we have to be prepared for that new norm. The new norm has already started in the Colorado River Basin where it's now considered a 14-year drought. We've only been in drought for four years. So what's going on? We need to know, and LADWP should provide us with a basis as to, eh, what's the look forward for the next, say, 10 years within the LA water resources uh, sphere? We need to know because one of the most important elements will be we'll need that groundwater when we don't have the snow melt in the Sierra and local basins. So we need to have better information about not only what's happening this year and the last three years, but also what is the best guess projection for the future? 10 years? 20 years? Uh, people have been making projections, and DWP has the water resources and the ability to find those people who are most credible and provide the public with a presentation as to what we have to look forward to. Not just this year, not to the year 2020, but ten, say 10 years or even to 2035 because it's going to get drier than it is now. Thank you. Very good. Let's go ahead and take item number eight. Certainly, item number eight. Department of Water and Power and Bureau Sanitation Report in res reports actually in response to motion Buscano bond and relative to the status of the Harbor Refineries Pipeline 
and Terminal Island Advanced Water Purification Projects. Very good. Let's go ahead, Jacob. Why don't you come on up too, so you can uh, testify and support, Mr. Adams? I'll go ahead and Susan. Would you like to go at least Susan Rogani from our staff? Sure. I, I know this is a two-part motion. Um, sanitation it will address the TI expansion. Will address uh, the harbor. Harbor Refineries Pipeline. In terms of the Harbor Refineries Pipeline, we have um, actually constructed a lot of the pipeline. We're pursuing the uh, construction of the remainder of the pipeline, actually working with BOE to construct some of that for us. Um, the construction of the pipeline will enable us to fully utilize um, all of the water that will come out of the expansion from uh, Phase 2 of Terminal Island. Uh, we are co uh, talking to additional customers, which would be uh, additional industrial customers, refineries, as well as um, talking to uh, the county to take additional water for the Dominguez Gap Barrier. So we are progressing with uh, finishing this pipeline in order to be ready for the additional water coming from Terminal Island. Good afternoon, Roshana Flaki with the Bureau of Sanitation. Um, Currently, the Advanced Water Purification Facility, ATI, provides approximately 5 million gallons per day of uh, purified recycled water to the Dominguez Gap Barrier. And uh, on Earth Day, we had the groundbreaking for the expansion. With the expansion, that capacity is going to be increased to 12 million gallons per day. And the construction completion is scheduled for December of 2016. Uh, we've been working very closely with LADWP to meet the uh, water quality demand of uh, potential customers, and uh, uh, we have uh, uh, we are very uh, confident that this uh, expansion is going uh, to be successful and to be completed on time. Great, uh, Jacob. Mr. Chair, thank you for having us. I'll, I'll be brief. Realize we're the last uh, last item. Uh, this has been a very important uh, uh, project for Councilman Joe Buscaino. Uh, we are home to three, actually four large refineries. Um, although this began in 2008 and a little earlier than that, um, out of everything we heard today, it's probably one of the most important aspects of water conservation and getting us off of using uh, portable water. Um, these refineries consume uh, millions of uh, gallons of water a day. And the sooner that we can get them off uh, drinkable water onto recycled water, uh, we're, we're, we can save uh, so much water. Uh, we have um, also a large lake. We have the Dominguez Gap. Uh, we're pumping in a lot of water, and uh, you know we've we've been pushing this project. We know we have the goals for the next 15, uh, 20 years, um, but we would like to uh, expand upon that. We can do more. Um, we have Hyperion that pumps out water. Hyperion sells water to the West Basin. Uh, currently, our neighbor to the west, Torrance, um, Exxon and Chevron, they're both at 80% recycled water, uh, while ours is still 100% uh, drinkable water. So uh, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, the councilman is anxious to work with DWP and sanitation and get this rolling. We were at the groundbreaking as well, but uh, we hope to see uh, more groundbreakings at Hyperion and other facilities uh, in the near future. So thank you very much. Very good. Uh, there aren't any cards on this, so we'll go ahead and uh, receive and file the item as, as, as much as it was informational. And so I thank you all for your participation. And I think that brings us to a close. Thank you.